Welcome everybody. Um, we have a packed room and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, and I want to say a huge and very special thank you to our speakers. I have been like a true public health person and I've done nothing except to coordinate the experts. Um, and the experts are fantastic because they are some of the busiest people in South Africa at the moment, working at the heart of preparing for the novel coronavirus, but they have given their time so that we can get reliable information from them rather than being subject to the panic and paranoia that we see on social media. This has been a rapidly evolving seminar, a little bit like the outbreak itself, and it might be a little bit chaotic. We have two people joining by video link, and um, I'm hoping that that's all going to work smoothly, but please just um, bear with us. The room is very full. We're not broadcasting because I didn't want to add too much technological challenge, but we are going to record. So if there are people who feel terribly uncomfortable and who think we're going to cause an outbreak by being just so crowded in this room, um, you are welcome to, to leave and, um, uh, and, and you can catch up with the recording which we'll put on the School of Public Health website. Um, we're going to run through the program pretty much as it is um, on the screen, uh, about 10 minutes of presentation and 5 minutes of questions each. We'll then have some time for discussion at the end and aim to wrap up by about quarter to two. Some of our speakers are going to leave early because, as I say, they, are all, uh, they all have plenty of other important things to do. So we'll go straight into it and I'll start off by introducing our first speaker who is well known to many of us. Head of Infectious Diseases in the UCT Department of Medicine and at Hurtiske Hospital, Mark Mendelssohn. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much. Um, which one is yours? Are you sleeping? This one, yeah. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks very much to Marianne for the uh, introduction and thanks for getting this special seminar. Um, Organised, um, it's a great opportunity, and I'm really looking forward to what my co-speakers are going to going to be saying around this. So I've been asked um, to, as as the title suggests, give some um, introduction in how this uh, came to light. And uh, of course, most of you, I'm sure, will have been following this anyway. But just to review that with you, and then look at some of the clinical aspects around uh, around this novel coronavirus. So the the first real um, notice of this of this outbreak came um, as so often does with emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases from ProMed uh, which is a program of the International Society for Infectious Diseases which surveys um, for outbreaks of emerging and re-emerging diseases and this was a post on the 30th um, of December of a undiagnosed pneumonia in the Hubei province uh, in Wuhan, an urgent notice on the treatment of pneumonia of unknown cause with cases that they were starting to see. And ProMed is moderated, each post is moderated by uh, international experts on emerging infectious diseases, one of whom, Marjorie Pollock, its deputy director, made the link immediately with the sort of rumors and the sort of posts that were starting to come out around this, um, these cases of pneumonia, of pneumonia with the SARS outbreak, which again ProMed was the first to, to highlight in 2003. So this looked very much like potentially the same sort of, uh, of illness. And as you know, originally the focus of this was thought to be the outbreak was thought to be the um, Wuhan Huanan um, uh, wet market, which was um, also not only had fish and seafood, but also um, was trading in uh, live and dead animals of a, a, a great variety, which you can see here. Um, and the original cases were all thought to have come from this um, market. However, it became fairly clear rapidly uh, with the sort of first with the first publications. But actually, um, in the dark orange, as you can see, these ca the cases there uh, by day were linked to the market. However, even in this initial publication there were already cases identified that were not linked to this market. And therefore, the market was either a uh, sort of concentrating um, area where there was a lot of human-to-human -human transmission, or there was this 
um, jump between uh, one of the animal species within uh, the market to, to humans. But there were clearly cases that were happening before, um, the, before uh, un unlinked to the human mar uh, market. And I put this slide up particularly because it, it does give a, a feeling of the incredible rapidity of the response, which is very unlike what we saw in 2003 in SARS. And that's been one of the, one of the interesting things to watch in this outbreak, but very, very rapidly um, you know, the, the case finding was activated, uh, the market was closed, the China CDC increased the response, they, the, the virus was sequenced, I'm not going to talk about the virology because Marvin is going to, but rapidly a PCR diagnostic was made and then we started seeing cases outside of, uh, of um, Wuhan. So in terms of clinical, what we know clinically is really uh, a rapidly evolve, a really rapidly evolving field. And um, what we what we know is a couple of publications, the first of which looked at the first 41 cases. And again, the graph shows the fact that there were um, cases back identified as early as December the first. Remember, the outbreak first came to light really at the right at the end of December. But even December the first, the first case. Um, where, uh, which was not linked to the, to the market. And the, the, really the clinical features are, were, are, have, have predominantly been in the severe, particularly the severe cases, uh, in those that have comorbidities. Um, there's a predominance in men over women, uh, and uh, the age range is, uh, as you can see, in, in these first cases, a median of, of 49. Um, the main signs and symptoms were presentation were fever and cough um, and shortness of breath and then uh, muscle aches and myalgia and other symptoms are also reported. Um, in, in terms of the second case series which um, again was rapidly brought out of, the, of 99 cases this <laughs> confirmed a lot of what I've already said in terms of male predominance and comorbidity. Um, as with many viral illnesses, lymphopenia, low um, lymphocyte count was seen. And although a raised CRP, C-reactive protein, was predominant in these cases, a raised procalcitonin was only in 6%, again, pushing towards this, the viral nature of this illness. And there was one uh, case of bacterial co-infection. The severity, um, the, the, the sort of number or percentage of severe cases from what we know at the moment um, is around 20%, but what we know at the moment is slightly skewed, and I'll come on to that. The requirement from, for ICU mechanical ventilation was around uh, 13 to 17%. There was also a, a concern from a case from um, Germany that came out of potential for transmission of an, from an asymptomatic contact. Uh, from an asymptomatic uh, index patient, a, po a person, apologies. And uh, this paper from um, Camilla Roth and, and colleagues in, in, in Munich uh, identified four patients who had um, supposedly got, uh, had transmission from this asymptomatic um, index patient. However, um, it has come to light um, uh, subsequently that actually the, the index patient herself was in fact symptomatic and had taken um, a paracetamol containing drug for uh, feeling slightly hot and she had myalgia as well so this was not asymptomatic transmission whether it will come to pass that asymptomatic transmission is proven uh, in a more minority of cases we have to wait and see but uh, many experts in the field feel that this is possible but not the, not the driver in any respect we also had the recent case two days ago of a baby um, who, at 30 hours after um, birth, had tested positive with a mother um, known to be infected with the coronavirus. And again, that questions how this is actually transmitted, the concern of vertical transmission. This is not proven by this case by any means, and I think we need to watch this space. So where are we today? Um, the, the World Health Organization gives a daily uh, update. Um, 28,000 cases confirmed. But remember that China, the case definition here is pneumonia and the virus. So this doesn't give the picture, potential picture, of a much broader um, infection where there may be 
asymptomatic people where you would only perhaps get it on serology. There may be patients, people with upper respiratory tract infections. There may be influenza-like illness. This is all at the moment unknown. But these global cases are the more severe end of a, of a potentially much, much larger spectrum. And as you can see, there are also from this other table, there are 25 countries outside of China who report cases. All of them initially were cases that were, that were um, uh, presented having had been in, in, uh, from China, but uh, they then took off human to human transmission within uh, many of these countries. So the uh, national and the NICD case definition of a person under investigation now recognizes that this is somebody who has an acute respiratory infection with one or more of coughs or throat shortness of breath without, with or without the need for hospitalization and the epidemiological link of 14 days prior to the onset of symptoms having met at least one of the criteria, which is a travel history now to mainland China, not just to Hubei province, someone who's in close contact with a confirmed or probable case and somebody who's worked or attended a healthcare facility where patients um, with the infections are being treated. So this is a person under investigation. And in, if you attend the Fudersky Emergency Unit, um, you, will be, you would be triaged, and this slide is courtesy of Anne-Marie Krupman, um, who developed this algorithm. And basically, if you fulfill the criteria, then the question is whether you would need um, resuscitation um, uh, management, where you would be taken to the resus, or you would be um, put into the per person would be put into I an isolation room uh, with a mask, a, a surgical mask given to the patient, and then a, a protocol for triage and for calling in the emergency unit consultant, the infectious disease consultant, etc., would be undertaken, and then they would be admitted. So infection control is the other, you know, is a major issue, and there have been some <laughs> fabulous, um, fabulous examples of do-it-yourself and, and over-the-top uh, infection control. And this does always happen. I think my favourite is probably the man with the bra, but I, I, it's a close, close-cut thing. But um, the WHO has actually given, um, has given uh, advice on the wearing of surgical masks, and actually um, the, uh, the need for a surgical mask, as far as WHO is concerned, um, is a patient who is becoming, somebody who's becoming symptomatic, or if you are actually looking after the person, they are do not recommending widespread use of masks in public, um, uh, public spaces, let alone putting underwear on your head. <laughs> it's important, the critical issue is hand hygiene and regular hand hygiene. Um, and this, this review shows, just reminds us that um, viruses can stick, hang around on surfaces for a prolonged period. Coronavirus, generally the group about three hours, <laughs> SARS 72 to 96 hours. We don't know yet how long um, for this novel coronavirus. And keeping your hands away from your nose. You know, unfortunately, people playing with their noses, picking their noses all the time is not going to be a very good idea um, unless you happen to be Frosty the Snowman. There's an issue about quarantine. Is, does quarantine work? You'll have seen, many people will have known about this case, particularly of the, of the ship that's now docked in Yokohama Harbor. Uh, originally, it's 10 cases and updated today, um, 61 cases in total now on the ship. Um, and quarantine, I'm not going to go into that, but we can have a discussion later if, some, if uh, people want, uh, you know, around the pros and cons of this. In terms of treatment, there is there was knowledge in, in during SARS that well uh, just after SARS that um, there was some seemed to be some benefit in severe adverse outcomes in the use of lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, which is as you know the antiretroviral, which does have some action on coronaviruses and reduced ARDS and death rates. And this is now um, uh, intensely being studied in a randomized controlled trial that started in Wuhan. Um, in the hospitals there to, to look at lopinavir ritonavir in treatment. There's also the, um, the, pro, the nucleoside analog prodrug uh, remdesivir, which has activity against, um, against coronavirus, which people are very excited about. Again, two trials, one in the mild to moderate and one in severe infections are undergoing in China as we speak. 
there's a big push to for vaccine, um, and there are more than a dozen vaccine programs now, and CEPI, the vaccine accelerator, is getting heavily involved. And there was an announcement of a GSK CEPI um, partnership. And this is really the, the, the crux, you know, can we get um, a vaccine out as rapidly as possible? <coughs> um, and that's the hope. Just of interest, yesterday the WHO Strategic Preparedness Plan and Response Plan was um, was published, and that'll be read by many thousands of people. And interestingly, on page 14, there's a picture of a UCT student at Kudaskia, which I thought was very nice. <laughs> so that's the clinical, that's the clinical and historical um, sort of introduction. I really would recommend to you ProMed for anybody who you know is involved in public health or is interested in infection. If you're not receiving ProMed posts in some way, either from um, from in your email, in Twitter, in Pro, at, um, Facebook, or um, on the website, please just you know go. It's free, and you can determine how often you look at the post. But if you want up-to-date information on this outbreak and many others, then please um, subscribe to ProMed. And I'm going to leave it there. And uh, I'm not sure if you want to take questions now, Marianne, or or um, continue. Thanks very much. I didn't mention the case fatality rate, which is extremely difficult to, um, to predict, of course, or to really calculate. And maybe our modeling colleague will talk about that. Um, you know, you just don't know the, denomin the, the real um, denominator and, and numerator. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to tell at the moment. But it's probably going to be, well, it looks to me as if it's going to be very low. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Margaret. You're talking about the use of the vaccine. Is there any any good reason to encourage people to have anti-flu vaccine as well to limit the amount of lung damage that could happen in the event of getting a coronavirus infection? Um, so the. Yeah, I think the, the I think probably the main one, well, the crux of the reason to to try and encourage influenza, is because obviously that would reduce the presentation to people with influenza and with, as influenza can do everything that this coronavirus seems to be able to do. You're clearly taking that group out. I don't. I mean, we don't know about. We currently this is the, the influenza season in that area, and we're seeing some of the cases that are negative are actually um, influenza B um, in particular. So, you know, influenza vaccination is always, you know, rec I would always recommend it, but how much of a, a role it's really going to play in a sort of second hit scenario, I think, is, is unknown. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We'll leave it there. We're now going to um, switch to one of our speakers who's joining by video link up. Marlon can just help to do that. And um, we have Kerrigan McCarthy. Uh, Kerrigan, can you hear us and unmute yourself? Yes, hello. Um, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Kerrigan. Uh, Kerrigan is Director of Public Health and Surveillance at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. And she does me a huge favor every year and comes to teach on outbreaks in our MPH course in infectious disease epidemiology, which I'm very grateful for because I would feel like an imposter to have to teach on that. And um, she's going to be talking to us on the uh, NICD perspective and the preparedness from the NICD. Kerrigan, can you share your slides? Um, I'm trying, Marianne. I seem to have uh, my computer seems to have glitched. I'm just going to stop and rejoin. Um, Otherwise, I, do I you have, have, have my slides with you. Yes, we do. So we can. Okay. Um, Let's do that then. There we go. And, uh, okay. So Marlon, can you share it, and then Kerrigan can see what's going on, and I will be the very professional slide operator. We are that one. Perfect, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Miriam, for the invitation, and, and lovely to speak to you and your colleagues. Um, lovely to join Mark um, and Juliet um, and your virologist. 
Um, so uh, my role in the um, uh, outbreak response, um, along with the NICD, is really um, to work with the National Department of Health to coordinate um, uh, responses across the country um, to ensure preparedness for um, this, uh, what we hope won't be a pandemic. Um, I think um, in sharing with you the uh, public health responses, I thought it was helpful to go back to this uh, diagram that may be familiar to you if you were ever involved in influenza preparedness. Um, the World Health Organization uh, reviewed the phases of a pandemic and um, we uh, uh, anticipated uh, uh, pandemic phases that were proposed were uh, phases one to three, which in which the influenza viruses were predominantly um, animal infections. Phase one was no known human infections. Um, and then on to phase three, where there was uh, limited uh, human infection or human infection with limited person-to-person -person transmission. Um, phase four infection uh, of, a, of a pandemic uh, occurs when, by definition, there is proven uh, sustained human-to-human uh, -human transmission. Um, and if you want to uh, go press the next slide for me, um, you can see that uh, phase four um, is more, uh, in more detail defined as verified and sustained human-to-human -human transmission. While uh, the next phase, phase five and six, really, you can press the next slide, um, define the, the spread of the disease um, within the context of the WHO region. So spread, uh, phase five is the spread of disease between humans occurring in more than one country of one WHO reason, region. And then phase six, community level outbreaks are in at least one additional country in a different WHO region. So these are really artificial uh, ways of describing the extent um, of, of an outbreak. Um, the, the globe then moves into a post-peak period and a post-pandemic period. And so if, uh, based on what Mark has shared with you this morning, um, you'll be able to see and appreciate that we are in fact um, in phase five uh, at the moment, or sorry, phase four, where we have verified and sustained human-to-human -human transmission. Um, and we have, we're bordering on phase five because we have a number of countries where human-to-human um, -human transmission uh, has occurred outside of China. But these uh, uh, documented cases are um, amounting to uh, a handful at the moment. Um, so what we're very nervous about is a transition from phase four to phase five. Now, the reason why the World Health Organization tried to characterize um, pandemics like this is so as to guide our response. So if you move on to the next slide, um, which is really a zoom in of um, a table of uh, actions and responses in the different phases of outbreaks, um, the red writing there uh, summarizes the advised actions that the World Health Organization suggests we take in response to uh, phase four and phase five and six. So in phase four, which we are in at the moment, where there is human-to-human -human transmission of an animal, animal influenza, we are sort of able to sustain community-level outbreaks. The World Health Organization advises that we direct and coordinate rapid pandemic containment activities in collaboration with WHO with the intention of limiting or delaying the spread of the infection. So many experts um, are looking at what is known about cases and about carriage and about um, transmission events um, anticipate that uh, we are going to be moving to phase five rather rapidly um, if we are not able to uh, contain the outbreak. Now, we appreciate that for, uh, as Mark has just shared, that while there are many uh, cases that are symptomatic and seek healthcare and are diagnosed and present with uh, severe infection, we're also appreciative that there are many, probably many more cases of people who have like influenza uh, present with mild um, and disease of uh, lesser um, severity. Um, lovely illustration was the story of the uh, German um, office worker who um, had developed a mild flu-like illness after being in contact with his Chinese work colleague who visited Munich. And uh, on the, he took a few days to stay at home while he recovered. And on the day he returned to work, the 27th of January, um, he was informed by his Chinese colleague that she had in fact contracted this virus and he self-presented to the uh, health facilities, uh, health authorities, and was diagnosed with uh, a novel coronavirus. Of course, uh, he had very mild disease and he had stayed at home. He would not have known uh, to um, investigate himself had um, his Chinese colleague not made it known. So the point is that um, 
is going to be very difficult virus to contain. Um, it's a very unlike uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers that present with um, awful manifestations and require immediate health-seeking behaviour. Um, so all that to say is that um, we, like the rest of the world, are in the containment phase, and our, our prevention uh, events and activities are uh, designed to be able to detect early and contain um, and uh, prevent uh, secondary generation of, of cases. So if you've moved to the next slide, um, I can share with you that, um, yeah, and then even the next slide. So what are our containment activities uh, in South Africa with regard to the uh, timeline of events? And these are, um, you see over here, the global evolution of the, um, of the um, outbreak. Um, the 31st of December, the World Health Organization was alerted. Um, Mark has already been through all this with you. But if you press to the next slide, you will see that uh, we were relatively quick to respond. On the 24th of January, uh, we convened a multi-sectoral national outbreak response team. Um, and then last Friday, our minister declared a uh, public health emergency in our own country, um, activated our emergency operations center. And since the 31st of January, we've been having daily meetings of our incident management team. So what are we trying to do? Um, if you'll go to the next slide, um, we have uh, created um, a team of uh, uh, dedicated persons who uh, each have an area of responsibility um, and deputies and a number of teams under them to uh, work on specific areas of um, containment and prevention um, of infection. So, um, starting from left to right, we have an epidemiology and surveillance team. Um, the uh, objective of this team is to uh, manage um, rumors and alerts, conduct contact tracing, uh, do data management, some operations research and training. Um, uh, I am responsible for the case management uh, track, which includes not only case management, but also infection prevention and control and a number of other things. And we have a very um, active communications track. Uh, the NRCD uh, Centre for Respiratory Disease and Meningitis is looking after the laboratory testing and we hope that a number of private laboratories will join us soon in that venture. Um, the ports of entry team is uh, managed by someone from Port Health, National Department of Health. Um, we have an emergency medical services representative and we also um, have a team to manage the logistics and coordination. So what have we done so far? If you move to the next slide. Um, starting off with epidemiology and surveillance. Mark already showed you our case definitions. Uh, today on our uh, website we published um, a uh, uh, the full um, uh, guideline document and also um, procedures and um, tools to facilitate uh, case identification and contact tracing uh, and communication um, between uh, facility, district, province and national. Um, the NRCD um, has always had a 24-hour hotline, but we have had to bring in a second and a third phone um, as we're receiving over 120 calls in every 24-hour period, um, mainly from healthcare workers, but also um, until recently the public, um, obviously of concerned persons and also wanting to discuss uh, suspected cases. Um, of the calls we had yesterday, only uh, three persons uh, were met the case definition and were eligible for testing. Um, as of yesterday, we opened a public hotline um, and hopefully that will decrease the number of calls to our 24 hour 7 hotline. Um, we've also developed data collection tools for persons under investigation, contact tracing and reporting. With regard to case management, um, in the same guidelines we have uh, training material regarding uh, infection prevention and control, uh, which uh, are not news to anyone. Uh, fortunately, the national um, infection prevention and control policy framework and workbook is being presented to the um, technical in National Health Council uh, today or yesterday as we speak and um, will be rolled out uh, to facilities across the country. But we are also facilitating um, and supporting the 11 designated facilities uh, to prepare for uh, receipt and management of um, suspected and confirmed cases, as well as strengthening infection prevention and control across the country by uh, firstly developing a facility readiness checklist, and secondly um, developing um, and, and um, facilitating the uh, purchase and procurement of uh, PPE. If we move to the next slide, um, in the laboratory diagnostic track, 
um, our our kitchen to go set up the PCR for diagnostic testing and work with global collaborators to um, validate the test and also to uh, obtain um, uh, positive controls. Um, we've also written and distributed uh, standard operating procedures for specimen collection and case investigation form. We've strengthened um, specimen transport. And to date, we've conducted over 60 tests, um, only two meeting the case definition today. We obviously um, have a lower threshold for, for testing um, at the moment, uh, where cases don't quite meet the case definition, but um, they have um, a contact uh, who had been to China and are symptomatic and we just want to rule out the infection. Um, our communications team obviously started the public hotline, uh, has conducted over 500 media liaison um, engagements at the moment, including interviews on community um, and national radio stations, uh, TV channels, um, National Department of Health has produced promotion material um, and media releases um, and obviously uh, we supported the ministerial briefings. Move to the next slide. Um, we uh, have um, been working closely with the ports of entry who have strengthened their protocols for screening of return travellers. Um, obviously, uh, included uh, the South African military health services in there uh, to strengthen their um, human resources. Um, we've had additional thermometers and staff. Uh, we've strengthened um, port health screening um, at both airports and land ports. And uh, we have a travel questionnaire for travellers returning from China so as to be able to potentially follow them up. Um, our emergency medical services have um, developed RPC protocols. Uh, we've conducted simulation activities with isopods. That's a, um, a, a contraption that can fit uh, over a stretcher while the patient is in to uh, create a temporary uh, respiratory isolation cubicle. And our EMS is planning um, for the likely evacuation of South African citizens from Wuhan. And I think that is where I shall end if we move to the next slide. So that's really what uh, we've been busy with. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank Marianne for, um, for being able to share with you one of the most important uh, components of outbreak response and management is managing fear and managing um, people's um, tendency to over-exaggerate and behave in irrational ways. And um, so I hope that this opportunity um, has provided some reassurance that uh, certainly uh, the government um, and ourselves at the NICD are um, committed to uh, working to keep our country safe as best we're able, given the dynamics of transmission of this particular condition. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kerrigan. Um, do we have any questions for Kerrigan? We will have to get a mic to you, I think, so that she can hear us, or I can repeat the question if there are any yes. questions. Yes. Thank you. Can you tell us about what PCR you do? Uh, the, Kerrigan. the question, is Kerrigan, is what PCR are you doing? Um, we are doing an internationally validated PCR, but the exact one I will have to refer you to our laboratory uh, experts. Okay, there's a question right at the back. Sure. Uh, how many labs in South Africa are able to do the testing? Um, Kerrigan, how many labs in South Africa are able to do the testing? So, um, at the moment, only the NICD can do the testing, um, but I am aware that one of the private laboratory groups has um, pro uh, been able to procure the test and it should be online after validation um, early next week. Um, the, uh, there is um, a global, uh, globally available test kit um, currently being produced um, by a pharmaceutical company and um, uh, uh, this laboratory, and I'm sure the other private laboratories will follow suit and, and obtain it. So, uh, of course, this is a key concern of ours, is capacity. And the NICD is not set up for 24-hour testing for large numbers of specimens. We can obviously do um, single uh, or uh, several cases, but not uh, volumes in the hundreds. Um, and so, yeah, it would be a very important thing to scale up uh, testing um, should, should uh, we have cases. And then perhaps I can ask a question because I know Kerrigan's going to have to leave before the end for Kerrigan and for Mark, um, which is if we think back to 2009 influenza, one of the biggest burdens on the health service was not so much the severely ill, but the worried well. <laughs> and how well are we prepared for the worried well? 
that are going to burden our frontline health workers and our laboratories. And I think there was even a situation in 2009 where the private sector ran out of tests at one point. So Kerrigan, I don't know if perhaps you and Mark can respond to that. Yes, and just from my side, um, the key to this is health promotion. Um, uh, you know, as the disease, um, uh, as the outbreak progresses, we will have a better idea, um, as Mark shared, of the ranges of clinical presentation and the likelihood of um, severe illness. And that information will go a long way to assisting us to produce messages that um, will contain and, and support the worried well. Uh, over to you, Mark. No, I, I, I totally agree, and I think consistency is critical. And um, I think there has been a, a, re a request from certainly at the provincial level that uh, if we're asked for interviews and, and it's the media uh, responses that we are, that is coordinated through the national department. And I think, you know, as Kerrigan's um, shown, the, the NICD is doing an awful lot of that, and that's quite right. You know, what we don't want is. Um, people giving a lot of opinions, which, because of the rapidly evolving situation, we just you know, don't know the answers yet. We don't want to promote fear, so consistency is very important. Okay, great. Um, well, certainly, um, thank you to Kerrigan, who has to go on to a call with the um, designated facilities just after this. And um, we'll hand over to... Um, our next speaker, who is Dr. Marvin Shah from the Department of Virology, who's going to tell us about uh, the virology of this novel coronavirus. And while he's getting ready, I just want to um, say that I think this is a, a learning institution, and they always say don't waste a good, a good outbreak or a good emergency. And this is such a fantastic opportunity for all of us to see how an outbreak response happens and what is involved. So um, even if we don't see a pandemic. It's been a really fantastic opportunity to learn. Thanks. Hand over to Marvin. All right. Um, thanks, Marianne, for for the invite. And you know, for some of you that, that are concerned, um, I, I have been spending this entire time in South Africa. <laughs> Jokes aside, um, uh, I think there has just been um, a lot of uh, panic and a um, huge amount of information that's like you know been coming out in the last month or so. Um, so just like you, I, I really struggle to keep up with all of the information. So I think in terms of talking about the virology, I'm I'm going to stick a lot to what we already know from before, and um, not to get into too much detail. Um, both because we don't have the time, but also I think we ultimately want to know, you know, how some of these viral, uh, virological um, knowledge that we had from before impacts on our current understanding about where the outbreak comes from, you know, what has been the the host range of this virus, how is it transmitted, and then to a small effect how um, they affect treatment, diagnosis, and vaccine development. So. So this is just a broad overview of um, the, the family uh, uh, coronaviridae. Um, there are uh, uh, four genuses, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, um, with the human um, infection occurring to three out of the, uh, um, the, four, the four genera of the uh, uh, coronaviridae subfamily. And if you look at the whole family as a whole, um, they have actually been found in a wide variety of uh, uh, mammals and birds. Um, They're just bulls. Oh, sorry. All right, just so, so as we wait, I mean, the. the mm, we turn over the game? So what, what, what that means is actually, um, if we look at coronavirus uh, and you know, the entire family, their place in the ecology in nature actually is uh, among mammals um, and, and various different birds. Um, Sweet. What was 
slip up and glue it. Okay, let me just stop it quickly. So, so they place in uh, in nature is really among a, a, a number of different species, and in terms of the human coronavirus that we know, they actually accounts for between ten to thirty percent of the upper respiratory tract infection, um, and you know in terms of cause common cold, which is where um, you know before before SARS where the place of coronavirus in medical virology is, um, they're only second to rhinovirus as the cause um, of um, the, the common cold that, that, that we get. But as you know, in more recent times, um, there's a lot of more development in um, coronavirus um, understanding, and that's largely thanks to, to SARS and MERS, um, which are, are both in the beta um, coronavirus um, uh, um, group. And Coming out of this, there, there's been a lot more understanding um, for, from uh, where coronavirus actually come from, with bats being one of the major reservoirs of the disease. So there's been a lot of virus hunting that's going on to look for the um, cause of SARS and other um, emerging um, coronaviruses, um, as well as MERS. And bat has been one of the kind of consistent place um, that the coronavirus has been found. Right. So. Just to talk about the basic um, uh, virology of coronavirus, um, it's an RNA virus with uh, a, a fairly large genome. In fact, um, it's the, the largest of all the RNA viruses. Um, this uh, novel coronavirus has about um, 29,000 um, kilobase. Um, and traditionally, when we um, talk to students about RNA viruses, um, one of the key things is that we always say that in its replication, um, it's relatively error prone, and the, the way um, the evolution takes place is, is quite fast <coughs> because that um, they do not have any proofreading function. Um, interesting about, thing about coronavirus family as a whole, actually they, um, they, they, they still evolve, evolve at a, a fairly rapid rate, but they possess um, a, a family-specific um, um, a, a gene in NSP14, which possess this exoribonuclease exo like activity, which um, does um, improve its fidelity in its replication by between 100 to 1,000 fold compared to the rest of the smaller RNA viruses, like, for example, enterovirus and, um, and, and influenza. Um, what this means is that this kind of gives us an idea of, of um, you know, its natural evolution in a host, and then when we start to gather amount of sequence, we can start trying to understand at which the viruses are transmitted and, and, and involved in the human population. Um, but um, to, to achieve the type of magnitude um, um, of diversity that it currently has, um, it actually uses another mechanism, which is recombination. So this is actually similar to <coughs> HIV. Um, so instead of the point mutation, what happens when you have a host that's co-infected with two different type of coronavirus? Um, and in, in an individual infected cell, you can have the polymerase reading from two strands of templates and switching between the two. And that combines the new um, progeny genome, which is kind of, it's a combination of the two source viruses. And this would allow the coronavirus have a, a, a much faster rate um, of diversity when compared to if we were just relying on the, uh, you know, the each generation's um, uh, of, of mutations. And um, as Mark has mentioned earlier, you know, this uh, NSP14 and, and the polymerase actually is the target of one of the novel um, antiviral drugs, remdesivir. So if we look at the, um, the beta coronavirus um, in, in closer details, um, and it consists of four um, different lineages. Um, the lineages um, that the novel coronavirus belong in is the, in, in the B lineage. And the, the closest uh, related human virus that we found so far in this group has been SARS coronavirus. In fact, if you just look at um, 
the um, the non-structural um, the gene that's responsible the non-structural protein and you see that the the novel coronavirus actually shares about 94.6 percent amino acid sequence um, and that um, you know to all our experts, that they think this means that SARS and coronavirus ultimately have a common ancestor. So the evolution that's been taking place um, has probably happening in another species, and they, um, that that eventually derived to both of these coronavirus in this particular lineage. Um, but if we are talking about the more interesting part of the coronavirus genome, actually it, it would be the spike protein. So incidentally, you know, the, all the electron micrograph that you see, the coronavirus, is this is kind of protruding and spike coming out of the surface of the virus, which give the actually the virus its name because it looks like a crown, um, coming from the spike protein. And the spike protein actually contribute to most of, uh, most of the, um, the, 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 di the divergence because um, you know, when we're looking at both the nucleotide level and amino acid level, comparing uh, coronavirus, um, the novel coronavirus with SARS and other other similar bat-like virus, you will see that, you know, in terms of similarity, um, the the novel coronavirus, uh, you know, takes a, a big dip in terms of similarity compared to the these other reference viruses. And what this is speaking to us is that you know a spike virus, uh, a spike of the virus uh, actually is the one that actually bounds the host receptor and ultimately confers, you know, the host range. And then the diversity in this particular gene of the virus actually um, is perhaps what is allowed um, to um, to infect a different host in a different way. And this kind of um, you know, help us kind of speculate um, on, on, on the origin of the virus. And, you know, just, uh, as Mark has showed you this slide earlier, um, you know, the, the, common, the common theory so far is that the, um, the, the ancestral virus, the origin, is likely from, from bats. And it's, it's one of two things. So one is either go through uh, intermediate species, um, which um, allow the virus to have a greater adaptation to human-to-human -to -human transmission, or is actually an entirely um, undetected bad virus, which kind of gradually um, develop these mutations that allow us to um, facilitate um, um, fairly reasonable binding to the human receptors and allow transmi transmission from human to human. And and this kind of the, the use of the receptor has been kind of a lot of uh, work in in recent uh, you know in the recent publications, particularly this one in Nature, um, and what they look at the spike protein and its interaction. So you know, in these pictures, that it shows that spike protein interacting um, with um, the various different receptors in human in both SARS virus and MERS coronavirus. And they use a very different receptor. In the case of SARS protein, it's definitely ACE2. And in, um, in the MERS coronavirus, um, it's interacting with CD26. And you know, in the case um, of the novel coronavirus, that um, from the in vitro experiment in cell culture that they have done, they have definitely detected that um, you know ACE2 has been the primary receptor that's a, a responsible, and you know the one receptor that's being used in MERS is definitely um, not. Um, and what does this mean? So obviously, you know, the, the immediate thought is, you know, where do we find cells with these receptor? And they actually are relatively abundant. So it is possible that uh, um, the new virus actually can affect a wide um, variety of cells. Um, the one that been found in particular high density, obviously, has been the type 2 pneumocytes in the alveola. Um, and um, I mean, this kind of goes towards the, the thinking that we have in diagnosis and you know, and, and pathogenesis, and that that's why it's causing the disease um, and pneumonia, and that's why you know when we try to detect virus, um, getting sample from a lower respiratory tract will be optimal. But the, this one paper that looks at um, the, the the single U.S. case at the early stage um, does show something interesting because um, so they the, the sample um, this patient at. Um, both the upper respiratory tract as well as in the stool. And in the 
uh, the days of illness up to 12 days of illness. They found a virus to, I mean, at least to me, um, you know, in these um, real-time PCR terms, a relatively, you know, high level of virus from the upper respiratory tract, these nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal, seems to be, at least in this case, um, shed um, substantial amount of virus, and we are able to detect a fair amount of viral RNA from it. Um, but interesting things is in the, in the one sample of stool that they tested on illness day seven, um, they will also be able to find, I would say, probably like a, a, a trace of the viral RNA. And, and what that means in this early day, we don't know. Um, in, the, in the day of SARS, there were a whole bunch of speculation you know, in one of the transmission in cluster in Hong Kong as a result, um, you know, the virus spreading from stool in a you know, poorly ventilated building. And, and that remains a speculation, and we don't know what, whether this is true um, for, um, for the novel coronavirus. Um, and that was just a one isolated um, kind of detection. Um, moving, um, so again, Mark um, showed you this slide, but I, I thought it's important to bring up and then actually kind of combine with some of the kind of biology concepts that, that, that we've been, um, been, been teaching. And that is um, coronavirus is an enveloped virus. Um, so usually enveloped virus stability is not um, um, as great as the non-enveloped virus, and they um, or potentially it can be inactivated by the alcohol-based disinfectant because their membranes, uh, a lipid membrane, will be dissolved by alcohol. Um, but um, I have to do caution that the use of alcohol-based disinfectant in terms of like in the hand rubs or so um, should probably not replace hand washing because um, you know the, the, the you know adequate use of disinfectant is, is always um, important. Um, and, and one thing that's also interesting um, that the novel coronavirus um, mirrors SARS is that, you know, the time that, that where it emerged was in the in the height of winter in the northern hemispheres, uh, and whether this has a role in the viral stability and whether it's got an important uh, importance in seeing the, the gradual decrease of cases um, um, remain to be seen because it, it could well have um, a seasonal effect. So just moving to the diagnosis, I've already said that, um, so generally to get the ideal sensitivity, you know, one will look at the lower respiratory tract. But this again comes from, you know, the, you know, the, the NICD um, site. And, you know, when we're talking at, um, about um, am, am ambulatory patients, so this is, this is, you know, a patient who can, is a suspected cases fit the case definition, but they are not critically ill. Uh, a combination um, of a nasopharyngeal um, or oropharyngeal swab um, actually might be fine. And but in, in addition to this, you know, one of the reasons why um, this could be a good idea is that um, if we if we think about lower respiratory tract as the main um, source. Um, or, or viral replication, and um, doing aerosol generating procedures could actually, um, um, you know, result in substantial transmission, you know, in the healthcare worker setting. And this definitely has been seen in a SARS outbreak. Um, and obviously, there, um, you know, PCR has been the main way um, of, of diagnosing the virus um, and so far. And, and as Mark has mentioned, serological testing is probably for epidemiological purposes to look at the. The you know, number of people that actually has been exposed. Um, I don't want to get too into the diagnosis. I think um, that has already been seen. And if you're interested in anything, you can please consult the NICD website. Um, but I would say that um, the, one of the things that we all been kind of have our eyes glued to some of these dashboards that you've seen across in different places. WHO has one. Um, and you know, it, it kind of give this live update of the number of cases, and we watch the outbreak evolve. Um, but I think the di diagnostic capacity um, can play a major role in, in, in these numbers that we're seeing in the dashboard. So um, those that work in the lab, you know, it's very easy to scale, scale up to doing, you know, one PCR to maybe even, you know, 24 PCR. But to, to doing tens of thousands of PCRs, you know, sometimes there is going to be a bottleneck at some stage. Um, and, you know, if we, if we look at the number of cases developing so far, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, the true number is kind of much more than this because they just couldn't actually um, have diagnosis in, in, entire, in all of those cases. But another important thing that we all have our eyes watched um, glued on in, is this kind of number that are recovered, and they always look um, really, really low. And, and other than the fact that you know this is obviously kind of a, a, a delayed 
um, a, a measurement. One of the main parameters that have been used to determine this is actually the sample people who are well and stopped shedding um, the virus. So they, they are doing PCR in this group of patients as well. So this also kind of limits the, our ability in, in looking at the number of recovered cases. So that's, I think, all I have to say. Um, I think, um, yeah. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. I think Martin, if you could stay we've got a couple of minutes for questions. At the back. Thanks very much. So I was wondering how well does the um, expression of the receptor is to mirror the localization of the um, of the virus and uh, you know, if it doesn't, could that indicate uh, a co-receptor being involved or, or, or not? I'm going to say I, I, I don't really know um, the answer to that question. I mean, there, there has I, I have come across um, some papers, and, and some of them are not fully peer-reviewed around, you know, describing the ACE2 receptor in the various um, different population. Um, and I think some of those are pretty small studies, but, but from what I've seen, I think one of the, um, the kind of previous paper that have seems to suggest is that um, the only thing that seems to come out is, you know, uh, the expression of ACE2 is uh, a little bit higher in smokers. Um, and I think, I think in, in the SARS outbreak in China so far, I mean, people have noticed that it's like far more common um, in male than in females, and I mean this may have something to do with because uh, the males in China definitely, you know, have, have a big proportion of smokers compared to females. But I I, I don't really know, um, you know, the, you know, other things about that, the the ACE2 uh, receptor expression. Unfortunately. Question. In the sort of slide above, you show the serology samples. Does does that mean they're doing PCR on the serum, or is it antibody-based diagnosis then? Or, and so that's the one question. What is the serology's role in diagnosis? And just in terms of normal coronavirus infection, is the normal, do you develop immunity usually, or kind of full immunity from a virus? So what's the expectation of those recovered cases, of those people uh, expected to be immune towards the infection? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think for the first question, I mean, definitely um, we are not doing any PCR. It, it, it's purely antibody-based testing, and antibody-based tests, obviously, you know, you, one needs to look at acute and convalescence. So I, I don't think it's going to play a major role in actual diagnosis. The main diagnosis is still respiratory tr sample. We try to detect a, a viral genome from, from those. Um, the second question around um, I immunity. So. At least this is the kind of dogma that we've been teaching medical students is that a lot of the respiratory tract infection, um, the immunity is transient. So this is kind of, you know, you, you get this infection of the body surface, you don't develop a robust immune response towards um, coronavirus or rhinovirus. And in any case, there's a huge number, um, you know, a huge diversity within this, the, this group. Um, for this uh, novel coronavirus, I don't really know. I, mean, I guess that we have to wait and see. With the SARS coronavirus, what happened to that? You also involved in the beginning of a new epidemic, of a new virus, but we don't know how it is. Is that still causing clinical infection? Or did they ever develop an effect of vaccination? Or what happened? I think, I mean, SARS basically just disappeared, right? I think, I think they just... <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it, you know, it, the virus peaked and then, you know, it, eventually it was eliminated, you know, our, whatever intervention that... Uh, you know, that we have device, um, you know, it was, was effective in, in preventing further spread, and we don't really see but it anymore. But there was never any effective antiviral or effective vaccine that made it disappear. It just... Yeah, as a, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it, it's, it's just very basic, um, you know, infection control and, um, you know, outbreak response, that actually. Okay, we'll take our last question here, and then... Just regarding the possible risk factors for severity. So it seems like children have been relatively unaffected with the exception of this new case. And would you want to speculate on what it might do amongst um, 
population of people living with HIV? I mean, I guess it's uh, no different to um, anyone else that breathes and potentially could um, be exposed to a respiratory tract um, virus. Um, but once again, you know, I can't possibly speculate on in terms of put a mortality rate and that sort of thing. It's way too early to actually uh, to look into those. Okay, huge thanks to Marvin. Um, that's a fascinating talk. And, um, we're now going to get our, our last speaker who is joining us also remotely is uh, Professor Juliet Pulliam, who is Director of the South African Centre for Epidemiologic Modelling and Analysis. Juliet, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, and she is sharing her slides. Um, Thank do you see my? Do you see the whole thing, or do you just see the slide that you're supposed to see? We just see the you slide we're supposed to see. <laughs> <laughs> we think. Super. So um, one of the things that is always amazing, but even I found um, uh, I was still amazed this time, is that almost faster than the outbreak spreads, the models come out to tell us what to expect. <laughs> And so we've saved the, the sums for last, and Juliet is going to tell us about the role of um, uh, the models in the outbreak and, and what we do and don't know and can and can't expect. Thanks, Juliet. Sure. Um, it's a big task for 10 minutes, so I'll do my best. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, insights and questions from models. I'm going to start, because I, I don't know exactly the audience, um, I'm going to start by just saying a little bit about what modeling is, and particularly applied epidemiological modeling, which is the kind of modeling that we're focusing on. Um, so for those of you who are not epidemiologists, the epidemiological part means um, that these models are related to the distribution and determinants of health-related states and events. Um, the modeling part means that we're using simplification to represent the key components of something that we're trying to understand more clearly. Um, and often models get criticized for being too simple, but when there's a lot of uncertainty, um, actually the simpler models tend to work best. And then the applied part is for application to the real world. So obviously um, the, the models that are coming, about, coming out related to the coronavirus are uh, models where people are trying to say something about how this actual outbreak will be spreading. Um, and how hard it would be to control. So I think there are basically five uses of models in public health, um, which I summarize as insight, estimation, prediction, planning, and assessment. Um, and I'm just going to provide a few examples of some of these um, in, the, in the time that I have. So I'm going to start off talking about estimation, so improving measurement and interpretation of key health indicators at the population and individual level. And in particular, I'll talk about two numbers that are used as indicators of how concerned we should be about an outbreak. The first number is the basic reproductive number. Um, this is often called R0. And this is an indicator of how well a pathogen can spread. And then the second number I'll talk about is the case fatality ratio, which Mark mentioned. Um, and that's an indicator of how deadly the pathogen is. All right, starting with the basic reproductive number, so the definition um, of this number is the average number of infections that a single infected individual will infect in a naive population. A naive population is essentially a population that hasn't seen the pathogen before um, and, and has no existing measures in place such as vaccination. Um, this figure is showing um, the basic reproductive number for a, a, wide, variety, a wide variety of pathogens um, that most of you will be familiar with. Um, Ebola of course, um, is a big scary disease, but it's scary not because it transmits particularly well, it's scary because it has a high fatality rate. Um, so its basic reproductive number is somewhere between two and three, um, most of the estimates say. On the other hand, we have um, pathogens like measles, which can infect, um, a single person can infect up to about 18 other individuals. Um, and most, um, most of the major pathogens that we have lie somewhere in between these two. So, so far there have been 11 estimates that have been published um, for the basic reproductive number for the novel coronavirus, and they range between um, about 1.4 and 4. Um, so all of these 11 estimates were produced by different groups using different methods and relying on different sets of assumptions. 
So it's hard to say exactly which estimate is best or that any of them are right, but we can be fairly certain <coughs> at this stage um, that the value falls somewhere within this range. So one of the reasons that um, we want to understand the basic reproductive number is we want to understand how easy it will be to control a pathogen. Um, so I'm going to show you a plot with the basic reproductive number on the x-axis and the proportional reduction that's needed for control on the y-axis. So this, that relationship is governed by this curve. And as you can see, um, if the basic reproduction number is below 1, then no, no additional measures need to be taken because cases are not replacing themselves in the population. Um, and you can see uh, that because the, the line is flat at 0 until you get to the value of 1. On the other hand, if the basic reproductive number is greater than 1, then this curve tells us how much we need to reduce transmission to bring the disease under control. For example, if R0 or the basic reproduction number is 2, then we need to cut transmission in half. On the other hand, if it's 10, we need to cut transmission by 90%. Um, and so this gives us a guideline of things like how many people would we have to vaccinate in a situation where we had a vaccine, um, or how much would people have to distance themselves from others and um, reduce other types of contact in order to um, control the disease. So. For the estimates that we have for novel coronavirus between 1.4 and 4, this tells us that we have to con that controlling the disease will require reducing transmission by somewhere between about 30 and 75 percent, which is a wide range, but it gives us at least a ballpark. Okay, so moving on uh, to the case fatality ratio, as I said, this is an indicator of how deadly a pathogen is, um, and. This, this is a, um, another dashboard um, from the WHO, which shows the number of confirmed cases and deaths um, that have occurred as of this morning. Um, and it's very tempting to try to calculate a case fatality ratio just by dividing um, the number of deaths by the, the confirmed cases. And um, if you do that, you get an estimate around 2%. Um, there's been a slightly more sophisticated analysis that, that's been done on um, the cases that are occurring outside of China only, um, and that also gave an estimate of about 2%, but with a very wide confidence interval from 0.1 all the way up to 8.8%. Um, and even though that's a more careful estimate, it still is, um, I think, needs to be taken with a grain of salt. There are a lot of reasons that uh, the case fatality ratio is very difficult to estimate, particularly early on in an outbreak. Um, and there are two main sources of bias. Uh, one that means that we're likely to overestimate the um, case fatality, and one that means we're likely to underestimate the case fatality. So the two main sources of bias um, are the one that Mark mentioned, which is that more severe cases are more likely to be reported. And I think this is probably the, the, the main one that we're, we would be seeing in this outbreak, and I agree with his assessment that 2% is probably um, an upper bound on what the um, case fatality ratio actually is. Um, but there is also a, um, a possibility that there is a, a delay, an additional delay, between when a case is reported and when the death is reported. Um, and that means that we can, in some instances, actually be um, under counting the deaths. Um, but I think that's probably not what's going on. Okay, I need to speed up. So the key takeaways from what I have um, said so far is um, that there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Control will require reducing transmission by 30 to 75%, and early estimates of case fatality are biased, and these biases could go either way. Um, okay, I have about two minutes left, so I'm gonna speed through um, a, a little bit here. Um, so I also wanted to say a little bit about um, the the ways that models can improve our understandings of the dynamics and health of disease more generally, and specifically address the question of what models can tell us about the potential impact of countermeasures. Um, and we'll see how far I get, but um, I want to focus on isolation of sick individuals, quarantine of them, and airport screening. So in order to um, provide some context for that, I think it's important that everyone be aware of the natural history of infection. So. Um, this is not specifically for coronavirus. This is um, a generic uh, representation. 
But essentially, when we're thinking about the epidemiology of a disease, we're interested in, in the time it takes for certain events to occur. So once someone is infected, um, they go through both an incubation period, which is the time from infection to the onset of symptoms, and a latent period, which is the time from infection to the onset of shedding. Um, and the, um, the relationship between these two different onset times um, actually says a lot about or, or determines to a great extent the um, ability to control an outbreak. Um, so infections like flu and HIV are infectious um, well before the onset of symptoms, um, and that, um, that could be problematic. Um, whereas something like Ebola has a mode of transmission that is strongly linked to the disease symptoms, so the timing of onset of symptoms can be thought of as equivalent to the onset of timing um, of transmissibility, and um, that makes things much easier to control. Um, so this is a, a plot from a paper published in 2004, which um, breaks, uh, sh shows on the x-axis the proportion of infections that occur prior to symptoms or by asymptomatic infection, and um, on the y-axis, again, is the basic reproductive number. Um, and we can put novel coronavirus on here um, without, the, as we've mentioned, there's a great deal of uncertainty about um, how much infection is occurring um, during the asymptomatic period or in individuals who don't, don't have clinical disease, um, but uh, we at least know roughly where it is on the R-naught scale. Um, and so then we can use this, uh, and we can, using mathematical models, put some curves on here. So if a infection is below this curve that I just put it on, um, then that means that isolation alone, isolation of um, infected cases um, at a very high level will be sufficient to eliminate transmission. Um, it's also true that if we add quarantine, so contact tracing um, and quarantine of individuals who have been exposed but are not yet um, known to be infected, that um, you can actually bring, uh, bring the area where control is possible uh, much higher. Okay, and then I'll just say very uh, briefly that um, the, the timing of um, infectious, infectiousness relative to, um, to symptoms is also relevant for um, attempts at airport screening. So Kerrigan mentioned um, that, that South Africa has started doing um, screening at the port of entry, um, and this is there's there's two publications I'm aware of that have looked at the efficacy of this. Um, both I think using some assumptions that this coronavirus is similar to SARS in terms of the timing of events, um, but they're both very pessimistic. So um, in this article by Gostick et al., uh, their maximum efficacy from airport screening is about. 33% uh, of cases would be um, would be caught through those mechanisms, um, and this is another paper from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where they, um, which I think came out a day or two ago, um, where they estimated that uh, almost half of cases would not be detected um, even with uh, both exit and entry screening. Um, so these these papers don't come to quite the same conclusions, but they both um, are saying that. Uh, a very high proportion of cases would be missed due to airport screening. So a major question that remains is how much transmission occurs before patients have symptoms. Um, at least some people seem to transmit before they know they're sick. Um, we talked about the case in Germany, um, and I think there's there's a little bit of nuance there in terms of, um, you know, what, was she symptomatic or not? Um, she had taken some Tylenol, uh, but she didn't seem to realize that she was sick. Um, according to the amendment that they put out on that paper. Um, but in any case, strong isolation, quarantine, and social distancing measures are likely to reduce spread substantially, um, whereas fever screening at airports is likely to help, but it's unlikely to be sufficient to prevent spread to new locations. Okay, I think that's... Thanks very much, Juliet. And um, I'm sorry if we if we rushed you there at the, at the end. It's always hard being the last speaker in a, a talk where there's a lot of interest. And 
The reason people are leaving is because we delayed um, the start of this, so I know that, that some people do have other commitments. Um, I think, if, do we have any key questions for Juliet, who is still available to answer questions? Um, I'm sure there's a, a lot on modeling. And then if you have any additional questions for Mark or Marvin, we can take those as well. Everybody seems to have learned everything they could possibly learn. <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm sure if you want to come and chat to Mark and Marvin afterwards, they'll be around for a few minutes. I want to say a huge thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, I think we've all learned something through this and that it's been a fantastic opportunity to, to learn not only about outbreaks, but to remind ourselves about some of the core parts of the work we do around infection control as well, which is so often neglected. So thank you very much, and watch the space. Thanks.